Hi everyone. Welcome to the the Linux and the programming um, basics class. Um, today we will continue uh, to the next uh, section, um, which is the Linux networking. I'm calling it lecture one, but um, if you recall, this is lecture number five. We just finished the Linux basics, where we introduced the concept of Linux, um, how Linux developed over time. We also talked about the various parts of the Linux, uh, the kernel, shell, and the file system. And then when we we went through several commands, uh, starting with some basic commands like ls, cd, kind of things, and then we moved on to more uh, esoteric commands. Um, um, and um, we also like had some fun exercises uh, to see how these commands can work together. So um, today again um, we will continue. Um, uh, finish off that section. There are a couple of um, things that are remaining. So these are the things that we saw already, like um, the file system commands, um, grep, fgrep, locate, uh, unique sort, touch, etc. Um, so today we will finish up this uh, section. There were a few commands that are missing. I'm going to just talk about those uh, commands, um, and then we will start the Linux networking piece of the. Um, and the lecture. So, without uh, wasting much time, let's begin. Uh, uh, so, some more commands. So, these are some of the key commands, which are slightly advanced commands than what we saw before. The first command is um, tar. Um, it's the short form for to archive. So, essentially, um, a tar is uh, used to archive um, a, a directory structure. So assume that you have a directory A under that there are some files uh, B and C and then another directory B and then the D contains E and F and then maybe like G as an another directory structure. This entire directory structure is uh, there and uh, when we archive we want to archive as a flat file. So the tar command actually combines all these it goes down the hierarchy collects all these files and um, puts them all together in a single file. So that way it is easy to actually transfer this file and then once we extract this um, archive then we can get back the old uh, the, the file itself. And usually this um, uh, tar um, archives all the files in, um, in the ASCII format. Um, um, Actually, like I mean, the, the, it's a exactly format independent. So whatever the format is there underneath thing, it, it puts them in that form. So here is one example. Uh, this is essentially like tar cvfp, and then you can tar multiple files, and then it all puts together in one. And here the destination is given first uh, in the argument. So lab one dot tar is the destination, and then the lab one can be the entire directory or just can be a single file whichever one that you want to choose and then when we want to actually extract this file we just replace the C with um, X here the this command you can uh, actually go to man pages and man tar and then look at um, what these options are um, but it's it will be straightforward I think that, uh, the V will stand for verbose. Um, I think like I'm, I will I would like you to actually explore this uh, a little bit more. Um, so again, the command is star. Um, it stands for to archive, and then um, you basically give the destination first, and then you specify uh, which files or which folders that you want to archive. Again, here you can actually do multiple files, and then it will archive all of them too. Um, I want to explore this. Uh, I want you to explore this this particular command. The other command that uh, we will um, use is the gzip. Um, this is actually for compressing a file. So typically, a file um, has um, it, it could be it, like some of these files can run into multiple gigabytes of uh, information. Uh, but sometimes these files will have a lot of um, empty holes, or they could be encrypted and made it much um, tinier. So gzip is uh, um, a compressing utility which uh, compresses the file and again I want you to do a man to find out what um, 
man entry is there for G zip. Uh, so one thing is this uh, minus nine. What is minus nine stand for? You can you can uh, find it out when you do the man uh, G zip. Uh, here when we do the man. I mean when you when we do the G zip minus nine, the lab one from this command uh, dot tar, it generates another file called lab one dot tar dot G Z. The end G Z the subscript stands for it's a G Z file. And gzip is definitely a binary file, uh, so you won't be able to read it. Um, and there are utilities that you can use to open the gzip and read it. Uh, nowadays, like a lot of these utilities are becoming more and more commonplace. Um, to get back this, I told you like tar uh, minus xvf, which is shown here. Um, you can also do um, the first thing is what you do is like um, um, you do a Gz minus cd to get the the untard. Um, you can also do um, the um, um, there are other commands like gunzip g unzip, which is essentially um, unzips a file, uh, which is uh, from the compressed uh, file it brings back the larger file. And there is uh, nowadays like a shortcut which is the SCF z. Um, the Z stands for unzip and then um, uh, untar the file. So this is another handy command that you can use it for um, doing your operations. Then there are a few other commands. Um, echo, um, echo. I am fine. Essentially, like echo, whatever you put in, it just displays back. Um, so like I mean, typical first command that you write in. in uh, Linux will be uh, echo, um, and then you within the ports you say hello world, and then it echoes back that hello world. And then the other one is uh, clear, which is also um, an important command, which is basically clears the screen, so that uh, whatever you typed in it, it goes up, and then um, uh, uh, basically this a blank screen is uh, left for you to begin uh, your work. Then there are some special characters. Um, you, we already saw this um, the greater than sign, and then followed by a file name. Uh, essentially, like when we do the uh, any command, and then pipe and greater than uh, a file name, the output of that um, command will go into that uh, file name. Again, there are special uh, ways to actually distinguish what is a standard uh, out and what is a standard error. You can look it up um, when you do the, the man pages for that, and then uh, you should be able to see a uh, lot of uh, entries for that. Um, and then there is also like a less than that you can use, which is essentially the contents of the uh, the file now goes into the command. Um, and then uh, the pipe one that we already saw basically like that is so you can. Type the output of one command into another command using the, using the pipe command. Uh, there is also another uh, a nifty um, operator which is the backtick. It's also called backtick. Um, here you can see that uh, there is this uh, date has a backtick um, in front of it, and then also like I mean, in the, the, it's a single quote that is, um, or actually it is called a backtick. And um, so when we do this, I want to see like what you get as an output. Um, this is backtick date. You know that echo command actually echoes whatever is inside the code. If you use a backtick, what will be the output? And then uh, also, like I mean, there is a small uh, programming puzzle for you. Uh, seek one to ten, what will be the output uh, on this one? Um, essentially, like the backtick is used as a command um, um, a command. Um, Expander. Uh, essentially, what it does is it actually executes whatever following the backtick as a command. So, since the date is a command, it will execute the date and actually produces what the, the value of the date is. Same thing for uh, sequence one to ten. It prints the sequence in the, of the number one to ten as integers. So, it, it is fun to actually do the programming uh, this way. Um, so, now let's look at uh, just um, what the activities are for uh, for this week? Um, 
So again, um, I want you to use man to find the details on um, the command that we mentioned we saw earlier. And then I want you to actually explore some more uh, in the Linux command structure uh, with these following commands. So I have given this um, as an example for you. So um, you can use this uh, and then see what all things that you can get. Um, this will also become your lab uh, once you start doing this. Okay. So now we start our uh, today's lecture. Which is essentially uh, the lecture on um, uh, Linux networking. So, in today's lecture, we will be covering uh, the main ideas what is really networking? What does networking mean? You saw that Linux is a multitasking, multi user, um, multi CPU system. Um, so, the multi CPU and multi user are key aspects of what networking is. Then we will uh, talk about the OSI model, which is uh, one of the key um, concepts that was developed uh, for networking. Um, in fact, uh, there are graduate courses on OSI models, so we won't go into like gory details as to like what all the things. We will at least look at the basics as to what uh, exactly it stands for and why is it important in our context. And then we will um, move to um, um, the various other things in in, in the um, Linux networking area. Uh, so today we will be mostly like dealing with uh, this OSI model and why is it important for us. So um, how does it make um, the machines interact? That is uh, one of the key things that we will see today. So let's look at uh, what is networking. So the classical definition for networking is um, how computer or components um, in our now the terminology will move to just be called as nodes how they talk to each other that is the key aspects of networking so that is what networking is all about. Um, so we so far we saw how a single window single user how he interacts with the Linux system. Which is good in the sense that you can still run programs, but you cannot interact with other machines, other users using Linux so far. So today we will break that barrier and um, actually start talking about how we can communicate with other users, how other users can actually view your system, how they can communicate your uh, um, your session, or you can also see how we can. Um, ask a remote machine to perform a job for us, which is again crucial for uh, LSF for the load balancer type of application. Um, in fact, uh, the the entire computer industry is built on this uh, networking basis. Uh, basics, um, as you know, the today like I mean most of the browsing that you do, like uh, when you do the various um, uh, interaction with uh, the various websites, they are all using. The networking principles, and we saw we will see how um, we can do that uh, using this uh, networking thing. So, before we talk about uh, networking, a network itself, which is a, a passive entity where um, several computers are there and they are all interacting, uh, that network has few characteristics. The few characteristics are number one is the size. Which is essentially you can define it as the number of nodes in that network. So, for example, if um, there are five computers uh, connected, um, or say in your university you have a you have many computers connected to a, to a central server, or many uh, computers connected to each other, the number of computers becomes the size of a network. The second characteristic of a network is the topology. Um, here essentially uh, we talk about what is the configuration okay we know that there are five computers that are interacting with each other how are they connected are they connected one is just connected to one or one is connected to all of them those kind of what kind of uh, configuration that is uh, the main aspects that we will talk about. 
The third item in a network is uh, physical, which is how are they connected? Are they connected using copper wires? Are they connected using uh, fiber channel? Uh, here we will go a little bit deeper, not just consider the physical medium, but also like what is the speed? Um, are they connected on a table with uh, many many um, megahertz or how they are connected? So we will talk about that. And then finally the protocol, protocol is um, how do they talk to each other, so when one wants to talk what does it do or if um, some, somebody is talking and how do you interrupt that person, so again these are the rules of uh, conversation uh, very similar to how humans interact with each other, uh, so we will see some of these um, concepts in the next slide. So um, the characteristic, the size is determined by the the, the number of nodes as I mentioned earlier, and uh, there are many systems that are prevalent today, uh, the WAN or the wide area network, LAN or uh, local area network are two examples, but there are many many such uh, networks are av already available uh, in uh, use today. So that's where the size comes into uh, picture. What is the topology? Topology, as I mentioned, is uh, if one computer is connected to all of them or to the next door neighbor. How do they can how do they connect? That is the one. Or are they connected in a hierarchy? So based on that, you can have like a star connection, a ring connection, a point to point connection, things like that, and then hierarchical connection. Those are all like uh, point to be used topology. Physical, as I mentioned. Uh, it's the medium by which the computers are connected to each other, and today we have several uh, such mediums. Uh, one is the Ethernet, the other one is the gigabit Ethernet, fiber channel. These are all like um, characterized as various speeds, so that um, you have um, uh, uh, you can establish the connectivity. In fact, uh, I should add here that even Wi-Fi is also can be considered as a physical connection which is um, um, what is the characteristic of connecting wirelessly even though there is no the medium is actually the air that uh, enables you to connect. And finally the protocol there are many many types of protocol um, the earliest one is the round robin and then it was the token ring the round robin is essentially um, every computer is connected in a circle big circle and each one gets a specified time for communicating so essentially um, um, I communicate for my uh, 100 millisecond and then pass the command to the next one or the next one is implicitly it will take over so every say like 10 computers are connected in this uh, network every computer gets just 100 milliseconds so by one second you cover all the computers, so every second the, the computers get to connect, uh, get to talk. You can see like how inefficient this system can be, um, because if somebody doesn't want to talk, still he will hold up for 100 milliseconds uh, before he passes it on. I mean, before the control goes to the next person. Then uh, there were token ring that was um, uh, developed, which is mostly there is a token that gets passed if you want to talk. So if I want to talk I request the token from whoever has the token, if I get the token then I can talk and then when I have when I finish talking I still hold on to the token until the another person asks for it and then in that case I can just pass the token to that person. Again you can see that how inefficient this kind of system could be. Um, so there are uh, the in real terms actually like I mean the 100 base T, 10 base T things like that are more appropriate as a protocol and then finally the hyper transport uh, this is another protocol where it is all the point to point connections. So let us move on, so the next one so now that we understand what the network is now how do we make them connect. So one one of the significant uh, achievement in uh, the 80s is the development of this uh, open systems interconnection model uh, to enable how computers can talk to each other. Until this time, like I mean, the, all the uh, communication used to be very ad hoc. 
every company had its own rules and uh, every computer used to communicate in its own ways but this uh, open systems interconnection model pretty much standardized how the uh, the computers need to connect and uh, this helped uh, develop the whole internet uh, itself um, which is now as you know um, we cannot live without internet today. So the open systems interconnection model divided the whole communication framework into seven layers. Um, so the first layer uh, here is the lowest layer which is physical, uh, then there is a layer called data link layer, then there is another layer called the network layer and then the uh, transport layer. So these four layers are the, the lower layers, lower layers means these are the ones by which uh, the data actually gets transmitted okay. So um, now the, the next three layers the session layer, presentation layer and the application layer are at the top of the pyramid they are more um, concerned with the semantics of the message which is okay I am sending a message so the lower four layers are just concerned about how can I take get it to another person but the top layer is the one that gives the intelligence to that message so that it is routed in the proper way so um, again so um, if you think about like an human the, the brains are all in the top the application presentation the session layer and then these are all the other sense organs which make them make us walk around. So if you, if you just left it to these layers, these four layers, we'll be just walking around aimlessly because we know how to walk. But in order to reach a destination, we need these three layers. So let's look at how these uh, layers are positioned. Uh, again, as I mentioned, the OSI is a, is a big topic. It, there are graduate courses on just uh, this just one um, one aspect of it just uh, explaining all these layers and how they communicate how to build those layers. So we will not go into that uh, gory details we only will limit ourselves to why this is important and how can we use them use it in our um, networking uh, phase and then we will just move on at that point. Um, so let us look at uh, we will look at look from now the top down which is uh, we will look at the brains and then we will go into the more details uh, the, the lower physical layers. So the lay, layers 7 and 6 and 5 uh, there is a reason why we combine these three things that I will explain uh, a little later um, but uh, the application layer provides uh, different services to the application. So this is where the, the topmost um, um, the the all the gory details are shown I mean or the gory details are hidden but the actual semantics is shown. So it, it uses the underlying layers to do the work um, and here the application layer can be just your mail program the HTTP which is a website uh, or um, the telnet and uh, we will study in more details uh, regarding the next two which is uh, the FTP or the file transfer protocol and then the DNS. So um, this next layer is the presentation layer this converts the data from application into a common format uh, and vice versa, vice versa here is uh, when it gets the common format data from uh, the down below it converts that into the application so that the applications can be uh, correctly. The session layer essentially is the um, a layer that organizes and synchronizes the exchange of data between the application processes. Um, again, we we combine this because one of the key uh, protocol that we will learn, which is the IP, uh, the Internet Protocol, um, combines these three, these three layers into this one layer. Okay. So now let's look at uh, the next layer, which is the transport layer. Um, this is where the messages are actually getting transported um, and it provides end to end transportation of the segments. So 
example here is the TCP uh, which we will browse through now um, in the next section um, again this actually this layer encapsulates the TCP segments like what we are we want things to be done into layer packets and it also adds reliability uh, by detecting and transmitting the lost packets so here so whenever a packet gets lost this is the layer that retransmits that until it gets a um, message saying that that packet was received by whoever was uh, the receiver and then it uh, uses these acknowledgments and sequence of numbers uh, and sequence numbers to keep track of successful out of order and lost packets um, there are timers that are also included in this layer that help differentiate between the loss and the delay so if the timer is waiting indefinitely you know that actually like there is a loss and there are fixed number of time uh, fixed amount of time uh, of which how much it will wait before it can declare that something is a lost packet so we have seen like I mean from this one it is more like um, a real program or um, a command or something that you want service out of and now we talk about packets in this uh, slide where we now take that thing take uh, the, 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 the program from this slide break that into small pieces and then we try to send it to whoever wants to service that uh, particular program or service uh, request. So now when we go into the next uh, layer they are much more granular so we will go into that. Um, so before that I would just wanted to say a couple of words so I gave you the example in layer 4 that it is TCP uh, as the example which is it stands for transmission control protocol uh, this is a connection oriented protocol there is also another one that is uh, prevalent which is the user datagram protocol which is more like connection less protocol and but this is little bit unreliable so I just wanted to wanted you to know these terminologies um, because in future you will be uh, using these terminologies or somebody may ask you about these uh, things. So now let us go to the, the next layer which is the layer 3, um, layer 3 is essentially it is the network layer this is uh, the layer that routes the information within the network. So this mainly deals with all the address spaces addresses so um, essentially IP is a, a network layer implementation and it defines the addresses in such a way that the route selection can be determined. So we will look at what is an IP address and how to do how to actually assign an IP address or how the IP addresses are assigned today. Um, and then um, again uh, the it uses a single uh, address space for the entire internet internet network. Um, it adds an additional layer of addressing. So um, which is different from the the MAC address that uh, we know. So here, um, essentially, like I mean, for um, unreliable um, um, networks, essentially, like I mean, if the packet gets lost, the network layer doesn't care for higher layers. Um, And uh, since the higher layers uh, actually can recent packets, so this layer is not really uh, the intelligence is already lost when you come here. Um, and then basically, like it forwards packets hop by hop. So again, as we know that uh, if you want, if you have like many computers connected, and uh, from one computer it can actually hop through multiple computers and then reach the final destination. We will see like how this is done in a you know, chart in, in a little bit while, um, but I just wanted to give you the introduction on this um, and also it makes the routing decision as to um, how can a packet be sent closer to its destination. So all the time it is looking at the address and comparing with where it is and where is the destination and see what will be the next uh, um, the, the hop point that it needs to route to. and then if it routes to that point whether that will make it closer to the destination or it is going to be like far away from the destination based on that it transmits that packet. Um, and so essentially like I mean you have these uh, since I 
talked about all these things like I mean so there are forwarding tables and the routing table and uh, that kind of it knows at least its nearest neighbors as to who they are what is their address things like that so based on that it can actually like uh, um, send these packets so out um, again the, the routers um, can talk to each other to exchange information about the network topology so if uh, another um, router which is uh, having this uh, table routing table it can actually share the table with this computer so that it will know what is the surrounding network for that particular uh, computer. Now let us look at the data link layer here the intelligence is completely lost so we started with the packet information or actually the actual message then we split into packets then the, the previous layer the network layer was only concerned with that is it now when we go into data link layer even like we are losing that intelligence also here the data link layer is only responsible to provide reliable transmit of data across the physical network layer. it bundles bits into frames and moves frames between the hosts on the same link and the, the key characteristic of the frame is it has a definite start an end and the size so the receiving computer can determine from the looking at the header of the frame it can determine when the message will end and uh, it also has a definite source and the destination link layer addresses so this is the ethernet mac addresses for the, the computers essentially so um, again once the network layer decides okay this is where I am going to go so then it knows that exactly okay I am receiving it from this computer things like that so it, it is it is a um, clear addressing is already specified so and then um, the link layers detect corrupted frames and uh, some of them uh, also can resend so some of the the upper level tasks can be done at the lower level also this is uh, things are evolving so you will, you will see more of that and finally the physical layer which is essentially the uh, actual connection itself and here it moves the bits using voltages so we do not even talk about the bits and the bytes these are all like just um, the, the real um, communication channels so one of the examples is the uh, modern day example is CERDIS. Uh, or the serializer deserializer um, essentially like I mean there we do not worry about um, okay what is the address where it is going is it going in the right direction things like that here we just move one bit from one point to the, to the other and that uses just the voltage so here we look at uh, the eye opening various other characteristics whether the RF interference is there or not things like that that is all the worry that uh, this level. Um, so again there is no concept of bytes or frames the bits are defined by just voltage levels and very similar to so this is where the VLSI designers really contribute in the sense of um, our knowledge about how things transmit through uh, copper or any other medium or fiber or any other medium. So um, again so now we understood the various layers now let us put together and see like I mean how we can make use of this um, so as I mentioned the distinction between the TCP IP and the OSI protocol is uh, the top three layers are combined for the TCP IP which is essentially like what we will be dealing with in the Linux networking side the OSI is more like a generalized uh, uh, policy uh, specify specification so the TCP IP is pretty much the implementation for Linux uh, you can think of it that way uh, again just a recap is uh, the application layer provides uh, the main uh, application support the applications can be like mail the web uh, or HTTP etc transport layer this is uh, basically the TCP end to end reliability that is the main uh, um, um, reason or main use of this layer the network is essentially like um, it is basically like the IP forwarding 
essentially it looks at uh, a particular packet in its address and it forwards to the the neighbor uh, using a best effort algorithm. So you can think of it as uh, what is the routing table and what is the forward table uh, tells it and then based on that it will do the uh, forwarding. And then uh, once that it decides like that put it in then the data link layer takes over and that helps in framing the message and then the delivery of the message itself to the destination. And it uses the physical layer or essentially the wires to send it and again here there will be like other protocols that will take over as to whether how to clock the system whether to send the clock along with the data or um, separately um, or is it a serial data or a, or a bus type of communication. Um, there are several uh, things like SCSI and um, um, nowadays it is all like the third is, is uh, basically it is a serial data that goes on. Um, so those are the things that uh, that that are done in the physical layer. So here is how uh, it is important for our um, Linux um, application. So the application layer is where the kernel resides in, um, and kernel also uses some of these the concepts basically. Like I mean, then these are all the various protocols, and that is actually uh, sent to the network interface, which is then is the physical interface to the, the subsequent computers and if you look at it this kind of uh, this model helps us to isolate some of the the various areas for example if uh, we are using a Wi-Fi or, um, or a fiber channel or uh, any of the, the wire wireline communication um, those are all like isolated from the top because only the network interface is going to change. So this helps us to actually um, reuse all the programs that we are writing, all the protocols, all the intelligence that we are building upfront uh, to still reuse and gain benefits um, even when the, the lower level, lower layers changes um, to some other thing. Again, same thing. Like I mean, if you consider any layer, that those layers can be changed independently of uh, the other layers, and that is one of the key benefits of uh, this model. So let's look at um, the the layer interaction uh, because this is one of the things that uh, we want to just browse through it and then uh, we can move on. Um, again, um, when when we start uh, doing the uh, the communication, the topmost layer essentially are um, essentially like I mean those are valid end to end. What that means is when we um, start a communication uh, we start at this layers and then the receiver wherever this application gets executed they also see all the way up to this top layers. Um, the transport protocol could be end to end uh, and um, the network protocol is uh, throughout the internet network itself. Um, and then basically like I mean the link and the physical layer may be different on each hub. So you can on one hub you can use Wi-Fi, the other hub you can use uh, a wire line, things like that. So um, these can be. So now uh, let us see how this is done. So here is an OSA interaction which is essentially like the top layer. So when the application starts the, the host essentially like I mean starts the, the process um, the various translations happen throughout the as the message goes down these uh, layers and then finally the physical layer transmits to the next one and in the next one the, the message is put together all the way up to the network layer where it is seeing that okay this is not my destination something else is a destination so again it, it, the, this particular router uh, transmits that message to the next one and in the next router again like I mean it, it tries to identify whether it, it needs to provide the service it is not so the message stops at the network layer and then it, it gets routed back and then it goes to the physical layer and finally it reaches the host where now it goes back all the way and then um, provides that service. So 
you can see that actually like this top four layers are end to end and the message the network layer is uh, throughout the internet working whereas this physical layer could be different for um, different messages and different destinations. So similarly on a TCP essentially like we do not have the session and the presentation layer but working wise it is very much similar to the earlier model where um, it goes through the physical layer goes up and then the IP layer essentially uh, deciphers and says that okay hey this is not the destination so go to the next hop so the next hop point or the next router takes over and this could be like many actually as illustrated in the bottom diagram. Uh, there could be one like couple of routers or many routers or if the host is directly connected to the other host then you can directly go up also. So it all depends on how your network configuration is we already saw that the characteristics of the network um, so that is what determines how this communication can happen. So now um, we will be going into the IP overview um, I just wanted to give some um, basic overview of the IP addresses um, so here there are three different things basically like um, you know, there is a network address a subnet address and a host address um, and then basically these are the numbers that uh, you normally encounter say like 140.12.128.28.1 um, and then how that connects to the other ones and then basically there is the gateway which is essentially what is the router and that translates into uh, or sends it to another one here this host is a 30 dot xx so you can see that okay the, the router is kind of an arbiter between sitting between these two and then enabling the communication so how, how this is done. So in the IP header essentially like I mean you have um, so this is what the consisting of a, this is what is in the message um, you have various fields of identification again I do not require you to understand all of these um, at in this course um, the main things that I want you to know are um, basically the length of the, the message because is also encoded and then what is the source IP address and the destination IP address here we also talk about the time to live. Um, essentially like I mean this uh, field um, uh, make sure that um, after that particular time it is declared as a lost packet and basically it can be retransmitted. So this time is used for to set the timer to enable the timer so that it can see like uh, um, when it should uh, retransmit and then there are some identification uh, bits and then there is a header checksum so you can see that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 these 6 um, uh, 32 bit uh, uh, words are essentially just uh, to set up the, the communication and then after that the, the data will begin. So and you can also see like some checksums essentially for the reliable transmission so um, when um, the destination encounters this and then basically the checksum and then the bit streams go match then uh, it can discard that and then uh, it will wait for the packet another packet to be delivered. Um, so there are different ways how to communicate and uh, it is achieved through these uh, protocols and you can also see that actually like the overhead is this uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 times 32 bits is the over, overhead of this uh, protocol because for every packet that you send you need to send these bits and some extra ones. And uh, this actually explains uh, how the communication really happens. Um, so the data, the transport layer attaches the header, and uh, it converts the data into a transport layer data. And then when it goes to the network layer, network layer adds more headers. It takes the whole thing, the network layer data, and then if you look at it, actually it is it has this the transport layer header and then the data. And then the data link layer now as uh, it, it puts its own header and it also puts a trailer um, blocks 
uh, and suddenly you can see that actually like the data is only like so much and all these are overheads for the communication. So the I introduced uh, several terminologies in this uh, lecture the, the packets essentially are like a, it's a encapsulated or um, it's a capsule a message capsule um, so let's go back to this picture so um, the message capsule contains the data and then it contains a little bit more so you can think of this as uh, a medicine say for example where the main ingredient main active ingredient is um, is the data and then you put a coating a sugar coating maybe or uh, using the header and then you have you are actually putting multiple coatings because it is going to go through multiple systems and finally like a, a top cover to cover the medicine uh, and which is the actual the capsule itself and that is how you can picture this and then that that is how it, it goes from various um, uh, places. So um, in this lecture we use like I mean different names um, so at the ethernet at the link layer we call it as a frame. At the IP layer, we can call it as a datagram, and at the TCP layer, we call it as a segment. So, you can if you look at this. So, here is the link layer. Uh, the link layer is essentially it's, it now we call it as a frame, and then uh, we go into the the network layer, the IP here, and now this is a datagram, which is uh, very similar to a, like a telegram or something like that. And then um, at the transport layer, it is still called as a segment. So they are all referred to the data with various uh, pieces added to it. And uh, we will briefly look at how these things are uh, um, added. And then um, sometimes we just use um, packet for all these things. So um, in the documentation and things like that, you will see all these different terminologies. But we may just use packet for any of these things. So now we go into uh, the more details, um, which is here. So we start with the lowest level, which is the Ethernet or the uh, um, the transport uh, the the link layer. So in link layer, we have a preamble. We Code in the destination with using a six bytes, and then source is also six bytes. The length of the data is given as two bytes, and then what kind of uh, what is the type of that message, which is another two bytes, and then we transmit the data. The data can vary in size uh, from 46 to 1500 bytes, and then there is a N piece which is like a CRC, which is um, also like which is more like an encryption that uh, constitutes. Uh, four bytes. So um, the destination and source are uh, the 48 bit MAC addresses, um, and then the type is essentially given as these uh, numbers. Um, so basically, like 0800 means the data portion of the Ethernet frame contains the IP datagram, and then the 806 is uh, the ARP type of. Data. So, um, so this is that the Ethernet. Now, when we go into the next higher level, um, we saw the IP. In IP, essentially, like I mean, now the bits are organized in this fashion. Um, again, you you see that actually, like I mean, this is the, the things may be small. The, the data is broken into multiple pieces there. Here, once those the data gets uh, added, then it gets uh, compiled into this form. There we have a version, some um, IHL, the type of service, the total length, and then basically some identification. Uh, there are some flags. Uh, we saw this one: the time to live protocol, header checksum, the source address, destination address. Uh, and then some options and padding, and then finally the data. This is that uh, the six uh, thirty-two bit um, or eight, uh, four byte uh, 
thing. So, so, so far this is like 24 bytes of information that uh, gets cal gets uh, sent. So here the addresses are now uh, different. Here they're more like uh, the MAC addresses themselves. Here they are like the IP addresses more. So again, um, the MAC addresses just provide a point-to-point -point or one hop. Whereas now the IP addresses will provide us to go from one computer to another computer far far away. Then uh, when we go to the next higher layer which is the TCP um, layer um, it is even um, so the way it is is here now we are defining what is called ports uh, there is a source port and the destination port and the sequence number and then an acknowledgement number. Then uh, it has several uh, flags, um, and then finally, like I mean, uh, there's a checksum, um, and then finally the data is also sent as uh, with this um, in this uh, segment. So here, the source and the destination are no longer the IP addresses. Now they are the ports. Um, so. Once you know the IP addresses, this IP addresses are already implied by the IP header, and we know which port to open on those uh, IPs. So uh, we, we will we will go into more details when we talk about um, the, the directory services, um, um, which will be uh, coming in the next um, uh, next sections. Um, and then the data offset is uh, 5 which means like there are 20 octets after that the data. So again um, there are predefined rules as to how to get the data get to the data and things like that. So on the ethernet layer again um, um, basically they are uh, the 48 bit unique device addresses are provided for each of them. Um, I encourage you to find the MAC addresses for your um, uh, machines. Um, you, can, you can try to find like what kind of uh, command is needed to um, get to the MAC addresses. Um, and basically, it uses this uh, ARP or the address resolution protocol in order to, to communicate uh, this uh, information. So. Um, in the Linux world essentially like I mean so um, we saw all these things essentially um, the the networking the inter process communication um, they kind of they are called uh, uh, it uses a special kind of pipe um, it supports several address families and uh, supports several socket types so the socket is what we will uh, see. Um, so here is basically like the various families that it supports. Um, in fact, you can also see that actually there's an amateur radio support is also there with the um, in the Linux uh, itself. Uh, but we will limit ourselves to mostly like the Unix uh, domain sockets uh, in this lecture. And then the sockets are essentially whether it's a stream, it's a datagram, um, and then uh, basically it can be a reliable Delivered messages or a sequence packet. Uh, uh, we will just touch upon these things. We won't be going into more details into this. Thing. So I just wanted to give you a, a, an idea about. Uh, so we saw from the TCP, IP, and the Ethernet layers below. So they communicate through these sockets to the the Linux. So when we learnt about this, essentially, like I mean the these are the the next higher layers, or which are um, um, which are on top of the um, the TCP layer itself, and which provides the the network uh, networking capability. So essentially, like I mean, um, the TCP and uh, they they open what are called the sockets, um, which are essentially mentioned here, um, and then these sockets are the ones that communicates to the network application from the user side. So here also like when I mean you can see that the kernel is all the things that are below um, and then they correspond to the network applications on top. 
So uh, a simple client server uh, mechanism is what we will talk about. So in a server actually there is a socket that is uh, created we bind an address to that socket and then the server just listens for the client. Client also creates a socket and then it connects that socket into to the server and once that uh, connection is received and uh, if the server um, is okay with that connection then it sends an accept signal back to the client and then the client starts sending whatever the message that it wants to send. So this is a simple uh, client server protocol um, an example of this is uh, the HTTP um, so again um, when we make um, do a Google search essentially like to search something actually the that client is making all these uh, kind of connections to the uh, server and then getting the data out of it and all the things so like now we saw um, this much essentially like where it creates a socket and starts communicating that start starting to communicate here represents um, all the things that we saw um, in this diagram which is below this portion and also all the things that we learn in all these uh, this diagram. So I hope like I mean now we have a good understanding as to what happens when um, we send a request and how that gets into the, the machine and how it gets communicated. Um, so this all goes back to that OSI layer definition or the TCP IP protocol that we talked about. Um, so there is a lot of things that goes in the background but, um, we, we do not we do not really understand or we do not really want to understand at that point. Uh, again it is important from a VLSI designers perspective because all these things ultimately end up um, in the designers hand and uh, VLSI designers want to improve these designs and make sure that uh, the communications are always reliable and proper. Uh, so with that um, we conclude uh, today's lecture and we will pick up some more of this um, um, IP addressing in the next uh, session uh, and then we will continue our uh, um, the other higher the uh, advanced um, uh, Linux networking topics. In the next session. Uh, thanks.